Hello, Real Vision members, and welcome to Real Vision Live, another episode. I am your host, Ed Harrison, and I am here with Mark Ritchie. I'm talking to Mark Ritchie. Hey, how are you doing, Mark? I'm, I'm great, Ed. How are you? Good. You know, and uh, let me just say, you're Mark Ritchie the second, or the lesser, as you, uh, your dad uh, might tell you to, to call yourself, uh, CIO of RTM Capital Advisors. So uh, I'm, I'm just letting people in to know, because the first time we spoke, actually, was after you had an interview with your dad, who is a legendary investor. Yeah, that was, uh, that was fun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was entertaining. I, I should give compliments to the Real Vision editing department for that because we went on <laughs> quite a few tangents during that discussion. They cobbled it together pretty nicely. It was very useful for me in many different ways. I think that one of the things that I learned was about you know tactical trading and so forth. And I think when I was talking to you earlier um, ahead of this, I was saying that you know I want to go back on that theme and talk about um, trading, not taking. Uh, this is my position on this particular stock or, you know, this is what this is a position that you should put on at this particular time. But more, you know, how you think about uh, real vision in particular and what you're getting out of it. And I, I think you told me a story about something that happened on real vision that you had a view on. And, and it, it was good in terms of understanding how you think of using real vision. Maybe you can tell the story. Yeah, sure. Uh, so before I get into that, if I can just back up, you know, for um, the sake of giving people a little bit of history. So the few other times I've come on other than the circus interview with my dad uh, was really been wearing sort of the hat of uh, the manager of our tactical program. And that's really just really like a, an active tactical management alternative to buy and hold. Uh, it's not sexy, but it works is what I usually tell people. So occasionally I'll have some strong market views, you know, either to be in cash or to be long, but it's a long only. But the other hat I wear and where I spend a lot of my time, which not just formulates the view for uh, that strategy, but for everything is, you know, in the private uh, pool that I manage where we trade everything, um, multi-strategy, timeframes, uh, different asset classes. And so this is kind of my homage to Real Vision and like the Real Vision experiment, if you will, because I'm a fan and a user, and I have been uh, for the last, jeepers, almost five years, I think. Uh, and But we use it as part of our almost filtering process and to stimulate creative thinking and specifically to hear different arguments, if you will. And when I use the word argument, I, I'm not talking about like what you do with your wife or girlfriend about like where you want to go for dinner on Saturday night, uh, <laughs> which is nowhere these days, by the way. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about a logical system of thinking, premises hopefully leading to a conclusion that is valid. Um, my background's in uh, philosophy a little bit, which I, I can get into. But the story you're talking about um, is you know sort of relating to one of the themes that you we've kind of heard. Um, over the last number of years on Real Vision. And, you know, real quick, what I would, I would say is I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is they're more concerned with being right than they are with making money. Right, yes. And I, I just, I can't emphasize that enough because they'll listen to somebody else's view and go, well, I disagree. Um, and ho hopefully they're... Um, Sorry for interrupting your video, but I have an important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on Real Vision's YouTube channel, that is just the tip of an iceberg. You should come over to realvision.com and see how we are not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts and fellow subscribers and learn from everyone's experience. It is an experience which you live and you learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1 to get a month's access to this incredible content. I don't think you can afford to be without it. Size that enough because they'll listen to somebody else's view and go, well, I disagree. 
um, and ho hopefully they're um, kind about it, but <laughs> often in Twitter and other places, they're not. Uh, well, that guy says this, he must be an idiot, uh, rather than actually thinking about the arguments they're making. And if there may not be um, a potential risk reward opportunity. So when I say I'm more interested in making money than being right, because I'm wrong, one, I'm wrong all the time. And as an investor and a trader, whatever your time frame, you're going to get things wrong. So potentially, is there an opportunity to even profit when you're wrong? This is what good hedging should look like. Right. You don't usually want your hedges to pay in spades. Uh, you you want them in case you are you know wrong or things go sideways. So the particular story, um, and for anybody who has you know been a subscriber, there has been a for lack of a better word, cautious equity and long bonds, long euro dollars kind of bias. Right. Uh, I think I've seen Raul tweet many times, buy bonds, wear diamonds, you know, and it was, I've just heard that many times. Um, and I never uh, bought into it per se in terms of the overall thesis. But after thinking about it enough and hearing about it, uh, and I don't trade the front end of the curve very much. So I'll trade uh, short term, you know, 30s and 10s, that kind of stuff. Didn't have a lot of experience in the front end. But then you guys did an interview where with John Burbank and Alex Gurievich, where he just presented the idea in a way I hadn't thought about, specifically, you know, using calls where you can get a, a really good risk reward relationship. So I thought about it and I loaded them and I looked at it and I said, well, there's a scenario here where if my view is wrong, this should work. And there's a scenario here where if my view is wrong, this may, or is right, this may still work. Right, yes. Uh, and there was real asymmetry there. Um, so I put some on. And this is one of the big things I would say to people in general. If you're in a position and you're, you're a little confused about what to do, I, I e am I am I too big? Always take a little off because you can put some back on. Um, I just did that with this morning with a with a particular position. Um, the same should go though if you think you might want to buy something uh, or want to own something. Just buy a little bit. Take a a position that almost seems meaningless so that you get a pulse on that particular market. The best traders and investors I know tend to be incremental, meaning they're, they don't make these all huge, all in decisions in one day um, to go limit long or limit short something. Right. It, it tends to be a process either in their own research and their thinking, how they're managing a position. So yeah, in that particular case, I bought, I think about the futures first and they didn't really go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and then I bought some calls and then as I watched it and sort of understanding how the market moves a little bit, not again, not being another reason to take a small position in a market you're not as familiar with, always make sure it's small because there's a little bit of, you know, outside of your area of confidence. The last thing you want to do is go in guns blazing. But then as the, the trade kind of progressed, the technical started to make sense to me. And pretty soon you add a little more in hindsight. Now, of course, I wish I had added. 10 times what, <laughs> what I did at the time. But it was just a good example of how you could disagree with somebody completely and wind up, or at least even in the process of how they came to a conclusion, but then by watching it, putting on a position, watching some price action and filtering it through my own process, uh, you know, came out with a, a pretty nice trade. And I could talk, you know, about a lot of different examples like that. Right. You know, let me ask you, uh, in terms of your philosophy background, how much of that is informing what you did in terms of legging into that rather than going guns blazing? Well, in terms of the way I do position sizing, it's, it doesn't inform it. I wouldn't say it informs it very much, but normally, so I'm of the philosophy that you want to be trading your biggest size when things are working. Right. Either when your um, when your timing is working, when the position is working, and actually the the interview that um, was done with Stan Druckenmiller, he made this point 
um, that you don't hear made very often. I, I listened to it a couple of times. Uh, the idea of knowing when you're hot and when you're not. And that was something that he was really good at and is still good at. Um, so I don't know that that necessarily applies to the background, but wh what I would say for the purposes of, there's so many views, you hear so many different things on Real Vision, right? Right. So many different areas of competency. It can be overwhelming. And I'm not saying I watch every one or because of our, or really grapple with everyone, but it's the idea where, let's say I have a view and you, ha you have the opposite view. I should be paying attention potentially to what you're saying. And so this uh, definitely plays into my background a little bit. I had a, mm -hmm. I had a teacher, I'll never forget this, like in, in middle school, you'd have these debates. And uh, there was one particular one where I, I think it was the pro-life, pro-choice debate, because in the 90s, that was like a hot, you know, different social debates, gun control, you know, pro or, you know, anti, that kind of thing. So in, in one of these, he said, okay, who's for? I want you on this side. And who's again in the class was like split down the middle. And he said, okay, now those four are going to debate as if you're against. And they were like, wait a minute. No, no, no. That's not what, that's not what we thought we were signing up for here. And his point was, you should, you should know what the other side thinks as well as what, as well, if not better than what you think. And the irony in that situation was there were people on both sides then that thought they had one position. And then when they really did some research on the other side, changed their minds. And others then were more staunch than they were before. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, actually, that gets to a question I was thinking of the whole bit as you were talking about confirmation bias and sizing of trades. You know, as you're getting into this uh, and you're looking for this non-confirmation -con information, there's a thing called... Um, the backfire effect. That is, is when you get the non-confirmation, you actually, you end up uh, being confirmed more in your belief because you're not really, you're, you're going through the motions in terms of the non-confirmation. You're using that as a, a mechanism to confirm your original position, your original conviction. How do you deal with that in terms of making sure that you want to continue in that trade and even size up in that trade? Right. Well, you know, for me, I look at both fundamentals and technicals. So normally I would, I would tend to use something like real vision to help me understand the real guts of the fundamentals better. Right. Uh, where the technicals is a little more, that's sort of art meets science, but that, you know, nobody else is going to show me their technical work and I'm going to go, well, that works for me. Um, you know, I, I often describe, uh, you know, my, I don't have, like, I'm not a classical chartist, say, like a Peter Brandt, or I don't have, like, one of these labels, but I use the old slogan, I know it when I see it, um, you know, that I, I know what a good technical setup looks like for me in terms of price and volume and trend and those type of things. So if I can line that up with a fundamental uh, picture that also seems very solid to me. It just increases the conviction. One of the other things, rarely will I ever invest or trade in something just purely on the fundamentals. Right. Okay. I usually want to see some technical confirmation. The only exception to that would be um, in a situation where something is so bombed out that your stop is basically zero. So a, a, a totally distressed. I don't. We. I rarely do that kind of um, thing. I have a few. Um, you know, in the long-term portfolio, but to me, a distress situation in its nature is mispriced, right? Meaning it's either zero or it's probably many multiples of where it's trading so that you can safely, you know, just on a, on a cash on cash basis with no leverage, put, put that type of trade on. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And you know, uh, my my view, you know, when you first started talking about that, I was thinking immediately about this particular situation. So when you say uh, you're looking at the technicals in particular, what are the technicals telling you about the US equity market right now? Well, and, and, you know, let me preface that by saying, you know, we've been talking a lot about retracements. You know, there was a huge move down 34% in the S&P. 
And now we've gotten to the 50% retracement level. A lot of people look at that as a level that is fundamental in terms of thinking about, you know, where you go from there. You could go to 62 or you could see another leg down. And the, the price action that we're seeing today suggests that, you know, we're at a level where there's a little skittishness in the market. Yeah, I mean, it's this pullback today and in general, even the snapback rally is it that big of a surprise. I mean, this has been a historic uh, slide, if you will. I, I don't have a really strong view in terms of do we, um, how far down do we go? You know, is it is it 50 percent? Is it 62? You know, in terms of I'm not really a Fibonacci guy either. Right. Uh, not that uh, I not that I have any disrespect for those who are or for the for the discipline. Um, I'm looking specifically for how how do individual stocks and groups shake out over time? Mm -hmm. You know, a couple of the first break was just it just did technical damage to everything. Um, in fact, you know, one of the things we could talk to, which has been another view that I've uh, that's been expressed in Real Vision that I, I've formed my own view on now um, is my own processes. Look at what's holding up uh, regularly, uh, and that's in any market, but specifically in declining or sideways markets. Well, four weeks ago, it was nothing. You know, just everything got clobbered, and and so then what you want to do is you want to wait for when the weight of the market comes off, what snaps back the best. And this is like the, uh, the analogy is when you hold a beach ball underwater and then you let it go, it comes bursting, you know, uh, out, out the surface. And so some of the best uh, ideas, and this is more in that intermediate, but even long term, if you're a believer that we're going to have another bull market at some point, you should not be looking to buy the laggards. You want to be looking at what has held up best. Well, that takes some time because you need to see the market, one, at least come off the lows and then back and fill. But in this first rally, the only group that is hitting, that I have seen, that's hitting the new 52-week highs list is gold stocks. Interesting. What I, mean, what I mean by group is, you know, you see these bunches of, or sectors, if you will, there have been a few almost virus plays, Zoom being one right. for obvious reasons, telemedicine. There's a, a stock called Teladoc. Uh, I do own that, um, you know, that have acted well. But there aren't any full groups, you know, that have really all gone to new 52-week highs on this rally. And for good reason, too. Everything just took a bath. Well, gold is the exception. That gets my attention. Um, the other thing that got my attention was it was it was a Monday three or four weeks ago. I mean, everything just got absolutely hammered. Uh, all the commodities on my screen. I think the only commodities that like weren't up were like OJ or weren't down were like OJ and uranium or something. You know, right. very esoteric illiquid commodities. I won't get into uranium. I have a view on that too, but that. That's there's been enough of that in Real Vision, I think. Oh, right. Yeah, we had someone just recently. In fact. Yeah, I was, I was listening to that this morning. Uh, so the the reaction though that the metal had, even the the underlying, immediately went right back to the highs and then pulled back, where lots of other, you know, forced forced selling assets. You know, to me, what that what that signaled was risk managers just came in on that one Monday, Sunday night, Monday morning after the Fed cut 100 to zero and everything just got absolutely annihilated. And they just blew out risk positions everywhere, every stock, every whatever. And you had this swift move down in gold, but then it came right back near the highs. Now it's traded through those highs. None of the other commodities have really done that. No. So that's that silver, is, as an example, hasn't done that. Not even close. Uh, that's very bullish. Now, back to the point about arguments, I have remained agnostic, uh, if you will, on gold right. for a long time. I understand both sides pretty well, I think, uh, but I can't, I definitely can't get in the gold bug 
kind of camp because it's just buy it whether it goes up, buy it whether it goes down, buy it whether it's raining, <laughs> buy it whether it's sunny, you know. And and the the sort of Warren Buffett that gold doesn't yield anything, and I don't buy that either of those arguments, which to me says you should you should trade it for certain trends. Right. Look for a look for a period of time where it looks to be under accumulation and try and take advantage. Right now, it looks like that's where that's where money's rotating. Now it it may be getting extended, but even the fundamentals right now, I mean, we're doing what, five or ten X the QE that we did and counting, uh, you know, right. that we did in 2008. So I think that that macro drop the backdrop makes some sense. And I hate again, I hate to be saying that I like gold. Um, it also reminds me a little bit of early 2016. So one of the things I run as part of my process is I look for the top, not even necessarily new highs. What are, what is holding up best relative to the market mm -hmm. at all times? So I'll be I'll be running lists of that every single day. And the last time I saw this many gold names starting to show up was early 2016. And we had then what was it sort of a tradable move from then, but it really didn't turn into the move probably the bigger gold bulls were hoping. But for me, if you had a nice three to six month continuation, I would, that, that's, that's what I'm looking for here right now. Um, and, and, and you know, by the way, I was going to say uh, before you said the three to six month uh, time frame. My question to you is when you look to put these positions on, and I'm thinking of it as you know these are tactical positions. What kind of time frame are you talking about? Well, <clears throat> it it varies by trade. So in the case of uh, of gold right now, you know, I would say three to six months would be like at a minimum. Right. And so I, I have I have another rule like there's a there's an old rule that never let never let a bad trade turn into an investment. Meaning you buy something at 20, you <laughs> right. should have stopped out at 18. Now it's at 15 and I'll just stick it away in my portfolio. Right. So that, that is a another huge uh, beginners. I shouldn't say beginners. I mean, uh, there are plenty of people who make this mistake regularly. And when um, you were talking to your dad, you guys were talking about that exact. He was talking about his doing that on occasion. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, he's pretty militant about you know taking losses, taking losses. Um, but yeah, but the the opposite though, there have been times where you can let a winning trade turn into an investment. Mm -hmm. Meaning, so you put on a position, it starts to work, and then you peel off a half or maybe even three quarters. And then you have financed the ability to hold the rest of that position for a much larger move. Because the bigger the move you're going to play, Ed, the more volatile it gets. Right. You know, everybody has this. They, they love the idea of, I'm going to play this for a 20 to 1. Right. Well, I can tell you, as someone who's had a, a few of those, and it's like, you're going to have some volatility along the way. And the bigger the, bigger the move you try and hold for, um, the the more volatility. So the ability to finance that with, with some gains up front um, is sort of how I would play it. So, you know, gold specifically is a, is a good example. I mean, I nibbled on a few miners, you know, two or three weeks ago, and they're already up substantially. I was hoping to put on a little more. Well, now I'll wait to see if we get a consolidation. Uh, maybe I'll buy a little more. And if it just continues to explode higher, I'll probably sell some but I think there's an argument to be made, even if you look at the 2009 to, you know, post the last QE, we kind of had a two year run for gold. I know the the big time perma gold bulls are looking for, you know, oh, Lord two, knows 5, what thousand. price. Yeah, yeah sure. 10,000. Well, <laughs> just pick a, pick a decimal and just <laughs> stick it behind it or yeah, add another zero, as they say. Um, but you know, uh, yeah, I'm not going to be holding for that. So I would, I would be more in that, you know, sell some, assuming it's working in the three to six months, and then um, only leaving what you're, what you're comfortable sitting with as well. So um, yeah, that's kind of, again, being incremental to the point I was making before you take a position. Um, you, and then as your confidence in it grows, you adjust accordingly. Right. Now, uh, we already have a few questions here. So let me uh, put one of these questions to you because I think it's relevant. Um, 
Emily was asking, can you give an example of a specific time that Real Vision content influenced your posi- your opinion and led to a profit? <laughs> sure. Um, I want to be clear, though, that there's never been a time, and this is from anyone, whether I'm talking to another trader, um, where they, they've shared something with me, and I just went right to my screen and... And grabbed it. And bought right. It, you you know? do your own research, right? Well, That's what you have to or do. at least I have to step back and say, how am I, how am I thinking about this? So um, what everybody needs to understand, too, is that like, like uh, I, I get asked all the time, what stock do you like, Mark? Uh, you know, they, they, they read uh, something about me in Momentum Masters, which is, you know, that, that's, you know, OK, great. And I, I don't get anything for that book. It's a fine book or whatever. Somebody just, you know, I do some momentum trading, but that's not all I'm doing. Um, one of the best examples, though, to answer Emily's question uh, or, and, and the point I was going to make is that I can tell you what I like. But I, I or I can give you the idea, Ed, but I can't give you the conviction. Right. That's impossible. So if I like X, Y, Z stock uh, and I say, yeah, buy this, Ed. You don't. You have not gone through what I have gone through to get there. Now that doesn't mean that you can't. And so the more important question isn't just what stock should I buy, which is probably the worst question. Right. But why? And then thinking about time frame, thinking about where am I wrong, all those types of follow up questions. Um, but one of the best examples is probably I hate to say this, but is Bitcoin. Mm. Um, I've, I have wrestled, I've never talked about this publicly. So, uh, in terms of privately, I, I, I have lots of funny stories I could tell about Bitcoin cause I've been in it for quite a while, um, and have held it as an investor, done a tiny bit of trading, um, recently, but haven't really been that comfortable with some of the brokers and those types of things. But when I first heard about it, I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard of. Uh, and I'm just talking frankly, right. you know, so I, I think I, I mean, I'd heard about it briefly when it had that big, the Mount Gox incident back in, was it 2013, 14? I can't remember now. And there may have been one or two headlines on uh, CNBC or something like that about this digital cryptocurrency thing. And I remember just thinking cryptocurrency, that is the dumbest thing uh, I've ever heard of. And then somebody passed me, this is right around the time. Uh, that I think either I found out about Real Vision, I don't even remember how I found that. Uh, Raul wrote this piece on GMI about comparing um, uh, Bitcoin to gold and what could happen if it moved there. And it was the first time I'd read, at least to me, what was a legitimate piece of financial, financial research on you know, someone smart actually that wanted to own this thing. Mm -hmm. And so that got my attention. And then they had done, I think they had Tour de Meester on maybe, and he had, you know, done a quick little video or something and just talking about it. And I, again, just very skeptical. And, uh, but I started doing a little bit of uh, research and you couldn't find a lot then either. You know, you Google stuff, there was, I mean, there was a documentary on VPRO. It was like all anarchist stuff. I mean, it was, right, yeah. this was like early, early days, at least what it felt like for me. And yeah, just couldn't really understand it. So I asked a few people who uh, I would thought knew a little more and kind of became more intrigued. And then it was either shortly before, right around the, the Dan Moorhead chain interview, mm. where he explained it as money over IP. And like the light bulb went off for me. And then the other thing I had in the back of my mind, though, was that, again, I'm a risk reward guy. So I, I kind of believe that, is it possible after thinking about, well, certainly if this became like the same market cap as gold, it's going to go up just unbelievably so. And so I just decided, all right, I, I came up with my own way of structuring the trade. You know, there, were, there was only one way to express that in those days, and really still only one way now. You just buy, buy some Bitcoin because um, there, there were no uh, other ways to play it. And so that was, that was mid to late 2015. I can't remember exactly when that interview was. And then 
there was another one uh, that either with maybe it was Winces Casares or somebody else. And so I just said, all right, I'll buy a little more. Uh, again, start a start a position. <clears throat> and that experience and then holding the position actually speaks to the point I was making before. Mm-hmm. So I have a, I think, a, a differentiated view on Bitcoin that at least I haven't heard expressed by other people, which I'm happy to get into if you want. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely would. I'd like to hear that, definitely. But you go into what you're talking about now. Well, let's get into that in a second. <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll just, I'll just kind of. Okay, so uh, Mark, let me just interrupt you for a second because we just heard. Uh, that uh, Vimeo's uh, crapped out. So this is not, now this is live to tape instead of live. But uh, go ahead with your, because you're, you're talking about this particular incident when you got conviction about crypto. But I do want to come back to, uh, you know, you were talking about your fundamental view on, on crypto. But let's let's go with the story here. Yeah, so um, to sort of sum up, you know, in terms of the question uh, was originally, <clears throat> when did you see something that, you know, had you change your mind? Well, uh, again, to being open to to the argument uh, for it, and then listening to the argument, say for money over IP, to listening to the argument for digital store of value, um, and then really the argument for the amount of talent that was kind of going in. That's what sort of initially um, got me into it. I'd be happy to talk about you know some of the other arg- the, the anti arguments too, because I feel right. like I'm pretty pretty familiar with those. And, um, you know, at the time, this is again, 2015. So, uh, and how this plays into my thesis for today. So when I decided to, we, you wanted to buy some, it was, it was pretty hard to buy. Right. Uh, I mean, even for an, even for an individual, it was not easy to buy in 2015. And a lot of people don't remember this, but I mean, like a good example would be you had a few options, none of which for people that it was outside of their area of competence, which was almost everyone would be comfortable doing. But even opening up a Coinbase account at the time I was buying, I think they were only legally registered in like 20 states. Mm. And you had, you know, you it was very hard. Their limits were super low. It was like five or $10,000 a day total. And it was slow and clunky. And, you know, all the things, I remember buying it thinking, I'm either crazy, <laughs> like this is, <laughs> This is like, who's going to buy, who else going to buy this? You know what I mean? And there was no way that a, an, an institution of any way could ever buy it. Right. Uh, it just, it, it seemed almost laughable, you know, at the time. And, um, of course, in hindsight, you wish you'd have bought a little more or whatever. Um, but the point I would say is this in the same way, and many people have quoted saying, well, Bitcoin's had all these great runs in the past. Well, great. Nobody was there for them because no one could buy it. I mean, very few people really participated pre the madness in 2017. And I remember and telling I told about 10 people about it, mainly to see if anybody would even try, put a little bit on whatever. Right. And the uh, five that were sophisticated because I wanted somebody who's smarter than me to try and read some stuff on it to see what they came up with. And I don't think any of them bought. No, I know none of them bought it. And one friend of mine who was a gambler was the only one who he put, you know, a little bit of money out of it or whatever. So I don't know if that's not a good indictment, but uh, it just, it was hard, it was hard to do. And it, it was hard to use. I actually tried to get my dad to use it uh, overseas a little bit uh, mm-hmm. because he does do, you know, the idea of microtransactions, these types of things. And, you know, he was saying, it's just not, it's too clunky right now or whatever, but that's the same place that institutions are in right now. Where I was at as an individual in 2015 is where institutions are at now. Yeah, right. there's, some, there's some options, but most aren't comfortable with it. And most are not in. And if they are, it's really small. And the only ones who probably are are the, are the ones who can be aggressive, hedge funds, maybe some forward-thinking family offices, that type of thing. But nobody owns it, really. Right. And, um I can get into, you know, how I look at it now um, versus how I look at it then. Then the the, the biggest counter argument was uh, Bitcoin is for criminals. Right. Essentially. Yeah. This is a the dark this, web. This is yeah. This is something that only criminals use. And there's a really good example of just a bad argument. Um, 
against something. So, for example, let's just the, if, let's just construct this for fun, Ed. The argument would go something like this: um, <clears throat> first premise, if you know, you shouldn't own something that criminals use. Right. Premise two: criminals use Bitcoin. Conclusion: don't own Bitcoin. Right. Uh, well, at least it's valid. But is there is there any reason to believe the first premise? Do 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 you and I own things that criminals own? Well, sure. Yeah, criminals use, yeah, they, yeah exactly. Hundred dollar like, bills. Hundred dollar bills. If I pull out a gangster roll, hundred. It's called a gangster roll for a reason. It <laughs> right. doesn't mean we don't use cash. Same thing with diamonds. Criminals use all kinds of stuff. I mean that. So there's a bad argument. And then secondly, the second premise doesn't work either because if you actually look into it, it wasn't predominantly used by criminals. And there was a Real Vision video, uh, I think, with Catherine Hahn, where she explained the FBI actually used it to bust their own double agent. Uh, oh, huh? I mean, so that you know that was just one example of you don't hear that anymore. Now you hear the argument that uh, it doesn't yield anything, pr particularly from or it doesn't produce anything. Right. Same value crowd that has missed every great technology uh, innovation you know, forever. Um, it's not that they're wrong. Well, of course it doesn't yield anything, but tell that to somebody who wants to store their value in anything but their local currency, which is a piece of garbage. Um, the Ponzi scheme argument you hear, um, that one has never made sense to me. You know, this is the greater fool's theory. In some regards, all of speculation is a greater fool's theory. Of course I'm buying something, hoping to sell it to somebody else at a higher price at a later point in time, um, and so what I would what I would say to the to the skeptics is, what do you think? And this is really how I'm thinking about it now. What do you think the odds are that it goes up 10x from here? I'll ask you, Ed. What do you think the odds it goes up? Look, be conservative. Yeah, I would say uh, let's call it a tail risk. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's say uh, that's uh, second or third uh, sigma event. And we'll we'll give it a one percent. How about that? You think there's only a one percent chance Bitcoin can go to fifty, 50 to seventy five thousand from here? Well, I'm giving you the the, the tail risk event. Well, I, yeah, and I'm saying that has to be wrong, just based on its history, because whenever because it, of the volatility of it already. Well, certainly, we've seen uh, multiples of these ten x type moves. So if you think the odds are anywhere close to one in 10, you should at least consider it. Um, I think- Let me give you another way of looking at it because I think it's interesting. You were talking about uh, gold and you were talking about uh, momentum in down markets. That is, is, is that uh, the market's moving in one direction and gold is moving, or uh, gold miners, things associated with gold are moving the other direction. Uh, just yesterday, I was talking to uh, one of our anchors, Ash Bennington, about this. Uh, there was a fund for the second time, uh, Andreessen Horowitz opened a fund for crypto of 400. They're looking to raise $450 million in the midst of what I would consider a VC meltdown. So from my perspective, that's a signal. It's a signal, A, that you know there's money out there for this product. Uh, when other things don't have money, and then B, you're all, you're talking about uh, Andrews and Horowitz, which is a halo uh, company in the VC world, getting into this space at this particular time. Both of those are very positive signals from my perspective. Yeah. Well, I, so one of the arguments that I think is convincing is if you think that the digital ecosystem call it landscape, however you want to put it, will become an asset class, like an institutionalized asset class, then it will absolutely go higher. And the first thing people are going to buy is the one that's been around the longest and is considered the safest. Well, there's no debate on what one that is, which is I am more in the camp of, I would say, you said 1%. Uh, I think just even looking at a price history, the option markets would never say that. They would say it's probably <laughs> one in ten. Uh, right. I think it's I think it's probably fifty fifty, based on the history. If it's fifty fifty, you don't get a lot of fifty fifty shots where you you win ten, you lose one. 
Right. Uh, and Tim Tim Draper made this point when he was on Real Vision. Right. Um, quoting different Real Vision things because this is, these are the things that are run through my head. I have a good memory too, at least so I'm told. Um, oh, yeah. You know, and he was making the point about well, if you had a Monte Carlo, you'd be putting a lot of money on this. And of course, I think it was Mike Green pointed out correctly. Well, Monte Carlo doesn't really simulate the real world, which is true. But his the point was you just don't see a lot of those type of opportunities. So you should at least have something. And, and to my point before about if you're more worried about being right and you think Bitcoin's stupid, then you just won't own anything. Right. Uh, where I, I'd rather, I would encourage people to say, well, but if you're wrong, the potential upside is so much more that you should just put on a little. Right. Uh, dip a toe. Um, and then maybe, maybe by having the position, you do a little more reading, do a little more thinking, and it changes your mind. Um, but I think, you know, right now, it's, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, personally, I, the, where my view is a little different, I look at it like a growth stock. And I don't think anybody's made this point specifically. Mm -hmm. So in growth stock investing, and, and, or trading, I should say, or momentum, call it growth, call it momentum, there's what's called the 50-80 rule. Um, and generally speaking, most people trade momentum stocks is because when the momentum breaks, you better have a stop. Otherwise, you're going to you know, take a bath. And the 50-80 rule says that the biggest winners in the history of the equity market, 50% of them have an 80% decline at some point. Mm. And 80% of them have a 50% decline. So 80% of them are going to lose half their value at some point. Uh, and 50% of them are going to lose you know, four-fifths of their value at some point. But what often happens is the market pricing gets ahead of the fundamentals. So you'll get a stock, one of these big winners, it has a huge run, and then it has one of these 50, 80% type retracements. And some of them never come back. They never recover. We could think of lots of examples from every market cycle in stock market history. But the ones that do, what always happens is they tend to put in this base, and then as price is correcting, the fundamentals start improving. So in, when, in terms of growth stocks, you see sales and earnings going up. And often people will scratch their heads and say, you know, the stock's earnings are up 100% in the last quarter, but the price is down over the last year. doesn't make <laughs> sense. Well, because the, the stock, the price had already priced this in, and now it's maturing and growing into that valuation. If you look at the, at the price of what happened in 2017, to me, this is exactly what's happening. And we've had, we've had a, a period where weak hands have swapped hands with strong hands. Everybody who bought in uh, above 10,000 has been completely rinsed out of the market. If you bought in in 17, you took more than a 70% decline. If you bought in in 18, took more than all the weak hands are out, and the fundamentals have done nothing but continue to improve. The speed of the network is better, more people are using it. Uh, you know, I've read and heard even in the last few months, more people are using it to actually transfer and use money. So it seems to me like this is potentially set up for another leg higher. I would also say, I think that the old high is kind of irrelevant, uh, because it really is, Bitcoin's really only been above 10,000 for a few weeks, months. So I would say if it, if it holds 10,000, uh, over the next three to six months, there's a good chance over a three to six month period, there's a good mm -hmm. chance we we're going to enter into a new uh, sort of a new price range. Uh, and then the other way I think about it, and this is sort of the, what I'm grappling with, is it seems to me that it is a different asset altogether in terms of price appreciation. And what I mean by that is so for an equity, when an equity has a huge move up, the law of large numbers starts to become a problem where they're going to have to sell, in the case of Apple, say, a lot of iPhones, uh, a lot of tablets, a lot of things to, to continue a, a meteoric rise. So if Apple right. goes up 10x, everybody is immediately going to start crying over valuation, different things like that, and probably rightfully so. Uh, commodities, even more so. When a commodity has a huge run up, Everybody in the world will produce 
to, I mean, you know, bring you back down. Exactly. To supply that commodity to the market. You know, the, the one thing, you know, if, if the gold guys are right and they add a zero behind gold, they're going to dig up half the continental United States, uh, to, to bring every gold nugget they can find to market. Um, Bitcoin doesn't have that. Uh, and so what, and I'm not saying I have fully bought into this, but what I'm thinking through is I think there becomes an increasingly likely probability that as it goes higher, um, the odds of it sustaining its higher prices are increasing because of it's really trading more like a trust curve. You know, if you think of it in terms of anything you build trust in over time, um, the, the more time you have and the more dependence you can put on it and, and thinking it's, it's going to be around, the, you know, the higher degree of certainty you'll give it. So, you know, my view would be similar where, okay, if you haven't bought it, I would say you buy a little and if it goes up five or 10 X, you sell a little and you use that to finance holding the rest. Um, I'm not convinced it's going to be this global reserve currency. I, I'm, I am skeptical right. of that view, but I will say that if it goes up another 10 X, the odds of that, of that happening will have gone up. You know, I would say the odds of that might be one in 20 for me will have gone up to one in five, Right. you know, where any other asset, if you had told me I, I'm going to hold it and it's going to go up, you know, up many multiples that the odds it's that it will have increased to going up many multiples from there. Um, again, you know, risk management being prudent doesn't mean I'm going to be buying more at those levels, but I'll reassess. Uh, I, I don't know if that, does that make sense? The yeah, other, you know, I was saying there? We have to get you uh, talking to uh, Ash about this because he's very interested in crypto and, uh, and he, he wants to talk to guests about that. I had no idea that you had a, you know, an interest in the, in the space. But well, you know, I've been keeping my mouth shut on it for a variety of reasons. Right. Uh, one, just because I'm not, I'm not an expert in that traditional sense. Um, and I have some funny stories, even about the bubble, getting calls from, you know, I should have probably lightened up, uh, you know, just based on the the madness and euphoria. Uh, but you know, I'm happy to I'm happy to talk talk about it. And I I'm not in the I've been more interested lately to see are they going to come up with good trading vehicles and those types of things because right. I do yeah. think I'd like to do a little more trading in it, but I, I haven't really at this point. Right. So yeah, you've been outed officially now today. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's good. <laughs> good way of putting it. You know, I have. Uh, we, uh, even though we got cut <laughs> off from Vimeo because their site crashed, I do have a few other questions I want to ask you. Uh, I think gold. This gold question is a good one to ask already because we covered gold and we we're talking about Bitcoin, and so we're talking about these assets. You, you already covered half of this question. It's the the back half that uh, that I want to ask you. It's from George. He says lots of talk about uh, how we're headed in, uh, how we're in or headed for a deflationary environment. What are your thoughts on gold in that environment? Do all asset prices, including gold, go down first? Uh, I don't know if you have any views on that, but I think this is the question. Any significant technical levels to watch for now after a sharp snapback rally? Sure. I was presumably talking about equities. So, and you know, this is what I, I normally say, like to me, macro type stuff like one i always like these pure macro guys are too smart for me right uh, they're, they're just too intelligent they're like they're looking for these second and third order knock-on effects they make some really great differentiated views um but this is where i, I tend to default to technicals right um, so than anything else so and, and that's know. why i think that yeah the second part was more interesting yeah right now um and 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 defaulting to the ability to changing my mind, uh -huh. uh, you know. So right now, I would say obviously everybody is saying, or there seems to be a lot of people saying we're going to revisit the lows. We're going to revisit the lows. Uh -huh. Well, it's anybody's best guess because um, seventy percent of what are considered swift big declines. Um, I saw the study. I didn't do it myself, but. Um, you know, looking at some of these larger historical declines, it's it's roughly three quarters of them wind up either uh, retesting or undercutting the lows. Well, okay, everybody's seeming to be crying for that right now, um, which makes me a little skeptical because I like to be contrarian. 
Um, I think 2400 level on the S&P is an interesting level uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, that was, you know, kind of where we found our footing. Yeah, we undercut it and we sort of chopped around there. I think if we, I could see the market, if you're not in the full um, new low camp, I could see us retesting around that level and finding our footing. Um, but I don't have a strong, um, I don't have a strong uh, or in either camp, if you will, right now, because I'm just saying, let's just let let's see how things play out. Obviously, the headlines, though, I mean, if they can't get the economy restarted, we're absolutely going to new lows. Uh, yeah. I think that's probably a layup. If they if they would wind up in in further required quarantine, uh, I mean, th- which is why you you should only be buying the, the stuff with the highest conviction right now. But you know, in in terms of let's just assume that things play out the way maybe the market is anticipating, i.e., we start to slowly restart things in May and then muddle through. We're going to get some terrible earnings numbers, which we're already getting. Um, you know, economic more job losses, GDP. You know, I, I think it's just going to be volatile. But uh, even if we get a strong close below 2,400, I would just say, well, you know, be braced possibly for 2,000 on the S and P. Um, but at some point, if we get into another liquidity-driven situation, it's just a function of where they're going, the selling is going to take things, rather than do I have a magical spot that you know things are going to bounce off of or or retrace to. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. What, what about gold in that thing? Because yeah. actually, I think that, that George was thinking about thinking, gold. Oh, specifically about gold. Okay, uh, sure. In terms of its technicals, and not just not gold miners, but uh, the actual um, the metal, you know, the metal itself. Yeah, uh, I would say I have. I don't have a, a really strong opinion there either. Uh, the biggest thing is, do we're going to have a pullback and consolidation? And what I'm always you looking think for, that we will. I, well, I hope so. Uh-huh. But I, I'm always looking for when everything anything has a big advance is how does it act on the pullback? Specifically, do you do you pull back orderly on lower volume? And if we get into another full on liquidation type situation, we may have a really nasty pullback in gold. Um, similar to what we had, you know, four weeks ago. But no, I would say I think holding above, uh, you know, sixteen hundred would be certainly good, and and will continue to draw some people into the market. Um, I, you know, there's just lots. I don't. I, I'm not an expert on the fundamentals of gold either. This is that's more of a technical relative right, right, strength yeah. for me right now. Yeah. Um, so here's a, another one here, Richard. He says using optionality. What is a suitable way to express a bearish view on equity indices when implied volatility is expensive, uh, as it is now? And also, I would add, he didn't say this, but you know, realized volatility is higher than or has been than implied volatility. They're, they're converging towards each other. It's sometimes hard when the market view is correct, but the value of the option is falling as vol gets crunched lower. Read the uh, well. This isn't again. You know, my area of expertise wouldn't be would be more on. We've already had the vol expansion, so um, I'm not saying there aren't some possibly really sophisticated ways um, to play that. But that's not what I'm currently looking at. So I have to think about that a little more. But yeah, generally speaking, you know, when volatility just blows out. Um, I, I tend to be playing small to not at all, and I'm certainly not going to be playing outright directional and options. So I don't, yeah, I don't have a really good um, answer for that. Apo- apologize for that. But yeah, you, know. you know, let me explore this a little more. I think what he's saying is, is look, you know, I'm, uh, I think that there's downside risk, uh, and in fact, so much so that I'm, I would call myself bearish. But if implied volatility is high. You know, buying a uh, out of the the money uh, put or whatever it might be to express that view is relatively speaking expensive. What other ways could you deal with uh, thinking? Okay, I think that either I want protection or I'm outright bearish in the market now uh, when the volatility is as high as it is now. Yeah. So, well, I mean, again, this this is something I would almost never do, but. So the other options, obviously, the other things I would potentially look at in a situation like that. So if I'm buying puts on something, sometimes you'll look at them outright. Volatility is a little higher. You can look at spreads. Um, that's always an option. Um, you can look at doing some type of combination where you sell a call spread 
to also help finance buying a put spread. You can, I mean, if you're really, really uh, sophisticated and bearish, you can do a risk <laughs> reversal, you uh -huh. know, or you just sell the call outright, buy the put. Um, that's only for, you know, that's a good way to get yourself in big trouble if you don't know what you're doing. Right. Uh, so I, I would never advise that. I mean, the really the, the interesting thing about that question is because options are theoretically, I mean, it's just infinite in how you can express right, right. A, a view or a, posi a, a position. Um, so those are just a couple ideas. Um, so I have essentially you're financing <laughs> the the expensiveness of the put with another vehicle uh, that will in some you know way offset, and that's probably like buying or, or selling an option of, of some yeah. Sort. Well, so one 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 way I would I would look at it possibly, and this isn't super aggressive, but um, a safer way to do a version of what I just said was let's say you think the S and you know there's risk to the S and P at I don't know down to two thousand or something like that, you could look to sell a call spread, so that your loss there is not unlimited. Where if you just mm. sell the call naked and the market continues to rally, you're going to get hurt pretty bad. Where you sell the call spread, then you take all that premium and buy as many of the puts. At whatever strike that it'll afford you, right? Uh, you know that that's a, a little more managed way of doing it. Um, that's similar to how I played HYG, which is another one I, I sort of gleaned from. Uh, you know, the Real Vision camp it was like, well, that made a little bit of sense to me as a hedge. You know, well, talk to me about HYG because <laughs> here's here's a view that I have on uh, high yield. My view basically is is uh, I'll call it the Lehman Brothers view, and the view is 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 that even though policymakers are willing to do more than they were willing to do in 2008 and in 2001, they're not willing to do everything. And so at some point, they're going to draw a line in the sand, and then all hell is going to break loose as a result of having done so. I think that it's somewhere in the junk space, that that's where the line is going to be drawn. So I think that, yes, it, double Bs might get a bid to a certain degree. Fallen Angels will definitely get a bid, as we know. Uh, HYG, in part, uh, the, the Fed has said that they would buy it. But I think that high yield as a space in general, there's going to be dislocations there, and the Fed is not going to be prepared to move into that space. How do you play that thesis if you're looking at HYG or, or other ETFs like that? So I will answer your question with a question. Uh, <laughs> well, this is a good sort of workshop example. Um, Credit's not an area of expertise. So my question to you then, Ed, would be, okay, what is the, what's the vehicle that you think you, you are confident is not going to take the hit that, a, that, that the high yield would hit? Right. I is think that, that, is that the LQD? It, certainly, yes. And I saw something, I'm trying to think, uh, I think Lisa Abramowitz, uh, she was tweeting something out about LQD and uh, liquidity, how money's moving back into LQD. And we know that it has a bid from the Fed. So I think that there's definitely what I would say a, um, a safety net that, there that I'm not sure exists for HYG. Sure. Well, so there, there's one idea um, where, and, and then my other question would be, are, are you convinced HYG is the right place to be, you know, sniffing out the short side? That's the question. Well, so, right. Because so, I think that there is a there's a dichotomy. There there used to be a dichotomy, say, between, you know, um, single A, double A's and triple B's. But the Fed has taken that off the table because, you know, there was the potential that fallen angels in the triple B space would move into junk. And as a result, the Fed uh, wasn't going to give them a backstop. But now we know that's not the case. So I think that to the degree that there is uh, a line in the sand that the Fed will draw, the so-called Lehman uh, uh, line, then it would be in the in the junk space. And if you wanted to get a sort of ETF type of exposure, it would be you know junk GNK or it would be HYG. Sure. Okay. So you know, just talk. This is talking out loud. You and I are <clears throat> we're just spitballing an idea here. Um, I, this is not a trade endorsement, but so the first thing I would look at then is I would say, okay, those two have traded very correlated in the past. You know, if you look at least in terms of, if you put up a spread chart of the two of them, where you create some type of a spread, one, one minus the other, one divided by the other, it probably has moved in a pretty tight. In tandem, right. In tandem. Well, that's, that says an opportunity possibly, because what you can do then is figure out the difference between where. Wherever that classical relationship is, there's your risk. 
where you're saying, I'm willing to risk X percent that this is going to blow out of that range and the, the, you know, the downside of the range, it would be my stop. Right. Uh, so, and then that will, that will, you know, help you determine how to position size it. Of course you could do that with options as well. Calls on one puts to another, but then you've got all type of expiry problems and those types of, I mean, there's a lot of ways you could express it. You had mentioned this, I think to me the other day, and it actually made me sort of realize that's probably why the spread between the Russell and the Dow has just blown out, uh, and more so in this correction than any other. And I remember thinking, oh, there's a, that's sort of an, Ed was, you know, <laughs> really He's presenting. talking about something else, but it, it, it brought me onto it's this. The same, it was the same thing. It's a way right. of saying the same trade. Well, where are all the crappy credits? They're in the Russell. Right. On, See, on the, average. The, the, the trade is, the macro view is uh, that they're going to give unlimited firepower, but actually, no, it's somewhat limited. There's a line that they will draw, and you can say that's erroneous or not, and if we don't snap back from an economic perspective quickly enough, uh, that line in the sand will create a problem, and there will be an opportunity to be on either side of that line, and, 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 and therefore a, a spread relationship will blow out. It's very interesting. And it's also a, sort of a way of saying, OK, if you think and I'll ask you, do you think if we then have an insolvency, a solvency crisis, which I think, you know, a, a few have also said may be coming in three months, six months, as right. a, a, you know, that this may be a good way to play that. Right. Uh, yeah, I think exactly. I think that that's, you know, we're going to have solvency uh, problems. And then the question is, is a. Uh, where are those solvency problems? And B, uh, are the spreads that exist today in terms of the relationships reflective of that potential crisis? Uh, and, and if they're reflective, then there's no trade to be had. But if they're not reflective, it, or if there's a spread relationship, there's a relative value play that's not reflective of that crisis, then yes, I think you could go into that. So that, that's my general sort of thinking about it. Yeah, well, that's a good. I mean, I, I'd be lying if I said I probably won't put that on my list of things to, you know, <laughs> to think about and do a little work on. Uh, so you maybe get an email from me on that one. Good, yeah. So if if it works out, maybe you'll have to you'll have to throw me some beers or something like that. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> now, before we go, I have one last uh, um, question for you from Dwayne, uh, and this is, I think, about a fundamental question here. Uh, it says. Do you have any thoughts on the fundamentals and technicals uh, of agricultural commodities? Uh, nothing specific. I mean, I know technically, obviously, they've been in a long-term downtrend uh, or bear market, if you will. But uh, no, I don't know that space well enough. Um, I know that uh, you know Peter Brandt, whose work I do follow, he's been he has been in the camp that eventually. We're going to see a major bull market in grains again. Specifically, I think corn and wheat are the ones, mm -hmm. and corn, wheat, and beans are the ones he's looking at. Um, I I don't trade those markets very often. Uh, what I mean by that is only when there's a chart that makes a lot of sense. So uh, there was a piece on Real Vision I know somebody I think did recently on on weather trends or something like that. That was right. certainly uh, a divergent view. That could, you know, you know, again, I don't don't have a view that was that was just kind of interesting. So um, I do think, um, you know, in general, that uh, at some point we're going to have another bull market in commodities. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, but it's waiting around for that could be painful. So I would I would rather wait for the trend to start than, you know, trying to pick ahead of time. Yeah. So. I, I think that uh, we that's about it. Uh, I really appreciate I mean, I, I, there are many different things I, I, that are in my mind, but I, I, I got to put a line in the sand in terms of taking up your time. I really appreciate you doing this and uh, hope to talk to you in a, a real world setting in the next Absolutely. time that we talk. Yeah, this was fun. Uh, yeah, like I said, I'm a I'm a fan. So this is sort of like uh, how, how does somebody who uses it uh, communicate um, how how it can be effectively used. So, thanks for letting me uh, on. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life.
This will be the best dollar you ever invest.